Welcome to episode two of the Panasonic Cine Live Masterclass. Today's episode is hardware details, and by the end of this episode, my goal is that you should be able to reference this video to know what every button, knob, and port do on both the Vericam LT and the HRP1000. There is a lot to cover here, so let's start with the Vericam LT. Here on the rear right side is most of the I.O. connectors for the camera. Starting at the top is a 5-pin XLR for audio inputs 1 and 2. I couldn't find a pinout or breakout to connect to this port, but my guess is that it supports two balanced inputs with a common ground equaling five pins. A note on this port is that it only supports mic level signals, not line level. That is in contrast to the two three pin XLRs beneath it, which are inputs three and four to the camera. These inputs both support balanced mic and line level inputs. The next port is a four pin Hiroshi connector labeled DC out slash RS. The connector on the camera is female, and part number of the male connector to connect to it is on the screen. The pins are the following. Pin 1 is ground. Pin 2 is tally contact closure when paired with ground. Pin 3 is record start when paired with ground. And pin 4 is 12 volts of DC current when paired with ground to power an LED tally light. Below that is a standard 4-pin XLR 12-volt DC power input to power the camera. To the right of these connectors starts with the connector for the remote panel. This connector has many pins and is designed only for use with the remote panel. It uses a spring locking ring to fasten into place. Next is SDI out one and SDI out two. These connectors are technically capable of 6G SDI at 4K5994 compressed Bayard ProRes RAW. It's very specific, we'll come back to it in another video but more commonly used to output full quality 3G SDI, 1080p 5994 uncompressed. Below that is Genlock In. This term is actually kind of deceptive as this port is incapable of taking in a tri-level or black burst reference analog signal. Instead, it would probably be more appropriate to have this port labeled SDI In because that's exactly what this port is. It is the input for the camera return via SDI, and as the SMPT standard for SDI actually includes reference timing in the ancillary data, hence why frame syncs exist and work, the camera is able to lock on and adapt to the sync of the incoming video signal. In episode four, we'll look more at how the signal can be manipulated to achieve better sync to the camera. Below Genlock is timecode in. This is a standard LTC BNC port using 50 or 75 ohm coax to carry the unbalanced audio signal of the LTC into or out of the camera. Below that is the LAN port. When used, the camera can receive a DHCP or static IP address to connect to a network. This port is a 10100 port, not gigabit, and is incapable of transmitting any IP video. It is also not capable of PoE in or out. Finally, below that is a USB 2 port in the format of Type-B. This port is mainly for maintenance and servicing. Onto the right side of the camera, there are three mounting holes that can be used for a cheese plate, like the wooden camera side plate. Between these mounting holes is a flap that can open up to install a wireless module. At the top of this port is a USB 2 port type A to connect the module into. Panasonic sells two modules, the AJWM30, which is discontinued, and the AJWM50, but the Vericam is also compatible with third-party wireless adapters. If they don't fit in the hatch, there's a cutout at the bottom to run a wire for a USB extension. Up here is a focus hook. As this is a cinema camera, this pan aligns perfectly with where the depth of the sensor is to literally pull manually a tape measure for getting perfect focus. To the right of that is the viewfinder SDI and DC power out. When used with your own monitor, the SDI can do up to 3G SDI 1080p 5994 with custom overlays, or the SDI and power jack can be used for Panasonic's OLED eyepiece viewfinder. There is a ventilation for the fan. The small screw at the bottom can be removed to clean the underlying metal filter, and this can be done on the opposite side as well. Then there's a 12-pin Hiroshi connector for standard lens connection. Up front, there's a clip for excess wire. The knob for ND filters is here, along with an inscribed detail of what all four states do. Note the NDs are not motorized. The lens mount is up front, and remember, this comes stock as an EF mount. This model had the mount replaced, however, with a PL mount. And you can see the PL mount is an active mount with pins to connect through the Cook standard. The EF mount will also connect digitally through the EF pins. On to the left side of the camera. This side is rarely ever touched when used in a Cine Live config, so I'll speed through the items. Next to the ND indicators is a flap that opens up to adjust back focus of the camera. According to Panasonic, this is never to be user adjusted. It is fine tuned out of the factory. However, it might need to be used when changing to the PL mount. There's another pin to indicate the sensor for focus. The user one slash play button gets you into a clip for previewing from the SD or P2 card. The user two slash info button displays info on playback clips. 
the user three slash exit button exits out of clip playback. These three buttons can be reprogrammed as well, being user buttons. There's a big old record button, kind of describes itself. Menu gets into the menu. The vertical knob is to adjust iris and navigate the menu. System check button displays the system screen on the viewfinder output. Toggle slash white balance can be used to toggle white balance, ISO, and the shutter speed. White balance is default. The lock toggle locks all buttons on the left side of the unit. The power switch is a hard power switch for the camera. There's a phones connector to plug in an eighth inch stereo headphones to monitor audio. The hatch, and might I say, this is the most high quality hatch and clasp I've felt on a piece of gear, houses the SD and P2 card slots. The rear of the camera has a gold mount for batteries, but can be swapped for a V mount. It has a 12 volt P tap on the side as well. The top has a bunch of mounting holes, four for the handle, four for the remote panel, two for the eyepiece viewfinder, and two for the mic mount. Under where the handle lives is the GPS module for the camera as well. There's also a standard quarter inch hole for any accessory that uses that. The bottom has mounting holes for a tripod mount, quick release plate, VCD plate, or any sort of mounting. In the description for this video, I'll put links to various manuals Panasonic has published that serve to both understand the camera as a cinema camera and as a cine live use camera. Oh, let's also look at the remote panel. The remote panel has a three foot wire which connects it to the camera. The display end of the cable is not detachable. The home button always takes you home. Play opens the playback library to view content on storage media. TC displays a large time code clock. Info gives a detailed but easy to read information page about the status of the camera. View is a live view to see the camera feed. There are six menu select buttons to help navigate menus access with these buttons. The record button does its thing. The menu button opens and closes the menu. The exit button acts as a back button for the menu system. The press and turn dial helps to scroll through the menu and make selections and the lock switch locks all buttons on the remote panel. The remote panel is not a touchscreen. In the description of this video, I'll link to Panasonic's Vericam LT remote panel simulator where you can navigate the menus for yourself. Now let's look at the HRP1000. Starting with the IO ports. There's an ethernet jack for connecting the unit to the network. Although on a personal note, I wish this was an ethercon connector for extra security. I would only expect this out of the device as Panasonic did this exact thing with the hardware of the HRP1005. It is a 10100 ethernet port with PoE enabled to power the unit. There's a 10 pin Hiroshi connector for connecting to a CCU. This is not used in CineLive as there's no Panasonic CCU used with Vericam. When used with the standard broadcast CCU, however, the HRP1000 receives power from the CCU. Another side note, I also wish there was a dedicated four pin XLR DC power input on the unit to keep constant power to it other than just using the PoE port. What's funny is Panasonic did this on the HRP200. The last port is yet another four pin Hiroshi connector. This one labeled preview. Its purpose is to take in a contact closure tally and to output contact closure GPO when the joystick or preview button are pressed. The connector on the unit is male and the female connector that gets wired uses the part number on the screen. The pin assignment is as follows. Pin one is the preview contact closure. Pin two is ground for pin one. Pin three is the contact closure input for tally. Pin four is ground for pin three. There's also a ground screw to link the unit to a common ground. A note on our units, for some reason there was some sort of grounding problem that was happening and it was actually creating separate grounds be between everything. And so because it has a metal chassis, what our integrator ended up doing was just putting gaff tape around the whole unit as an insulator between each unit. Um, and that actually helped mitigate some problem they were experiencing with Tally in the, in the midst of it. I'm now gonna move the camera and we're gonna look at the buttons in a top-down view and I'm gonna explain what each one of them does specifically for CineLive. The power head button connects and disconnects the camera from the HRP1000. It doesn't actually turn off the camera head. The VF button, while would normally power the camera viewfinder, doesn't actually do that in CineLive. Instead, when running in version 5.100-00-0.00 or newer, the VF button enables or disables variable frame rate for the camera. The update to support this functionality dropped July of 2021 and that update can be applied using the SD card slot at the bottom of the unit. The bar slash test button enables and disables color bars output from the camera. There are no adjustment settings for the bars the camera outputs. Ref or call does not function. Auto white and auto black do exactly that. They perform auto white and black balances respectively. Auto setup does not function. Character does work and displays the character output on the viewfinder when configured properly. Matrix turns on and off the matrix mapping for the camera if this parameter is available in the current scene. Skin detail turns on and off skin details depending on the scene you are in. DRS does not function. Black gamma does work, but is dependent upon the scene that is selected. Assign works and needs to be configured by the user for the function desired. Assign status works and is a quick access to configure the following five buttons. These five buttons change between on off controls or mode selections, all of which read out on the LCD. 
There's the LCD panel, which is not a touchscreen, four rotary knobs, a menu button, which turns on and off the menu, an exit button, which acts like a back button for the menus, and an undo button, which works sometimes when you change a parameter uh, to undo whatever that last parameter change was. This row is scene files one through five with a shift button to be able to select one through 10. We'll go over what scenes you select in episode five and six. The store button allows you to store a scene or when pressed along with the head button allows you to start recording on the camera. The ND display does show what the current ND the camera is in, but the ND adjustment buttons do not function as the Vericam doesn't have motorized NDs. The Vericam also doesn't have color control motorized filters built in, so this display doesn't show anything when a camera is connected and these buttons don't function. The ECC button doesn't do anything, and the head button only functions for that earlier stated purpose of starting recording. The M gain display shows the current ISO. Just imagine another zero is off to the side here where these buttons would be to be able to determine what ISO the camera is in. So if it displays 80 here, the camera is actually in 800 ISO. If it displays fit 500 here, the camera is actually in 5000 ISO. If you go to ISO 10,000 or higher, the seven segment displays here will display a letter in the first spot. A being 10, B being 11, C being 12, and so on. The up and down buttons adjust the ISO higher or lower based on the EI settings. We'll look at those in the next episode. The variable button does not function. The shutter display works and displays both fractions of seconds and degrees shutter, displaying only the number for the fraction of second and a small D following the number for the degrees. The on button serves to turn shutter on and off, the sync button doesn't function, and the up down buttons can be used to raise or lower the shutter from the presets that are built into the camera. Next down on the line are some rotaries. These top three here are red, green, blue gain, and the three below that are red, green, blue lift or pedestal. The flare button does not function. The paint lock button does work to lock usability of the paint knobs. The detail dial works when detail is a function that works in the current scene. The select dial does work, and as it says here, we can hold it for one second to be able to rotate to other parameters. Cam select, temperature, and user select function properly. M flare and sync do not. We're nearing the bottom here. This is a dot matrix screen that displays the currently controlled camera. It also lights up red when the tally port on the back receives a closed contact closure for the selected camera you're in. Extender and de-extender lights do not function. The screen displays the current f-stop or t-stop of the lens. The staple part of any RCP, the joystick, sometimes called the paddle, functions to open and close the iris of the lens. And when we received our units, the joystick was a bit stiff. A few experiences, you can take a small flathead screwdriver up here to this screw, and you can tighten it to be able to tighten the tension I think it's three notches. Yeah. So that's that's the tightest one. I'm really having to... It's kind of hard to demonstrate on video, but I'm having to force that. And if we loosen it, the three notches... Now it's the loosest position it can be. At the lower part of the joystick is the master pedestal ring. Turning this ring right or left will lift or lower the black point of the image. The pedestal value is read out on this display here. The auto button toggles auto iris, which has custom settings in the menus. The relative button restricts the maximum aperture available to iris to with the sensitivity knob and the course knob. The relative knob restricts the maximum aperture available to iris to with the sensitivity knob and the range of F or T stops available to iris down to with the course adjustment knob. A visual of how this reads out is displayed at the bottom of the home screen on the LCD. The close button closes and opens the iris. The preview button sends a closed contact closure out of the same port as where the tally contact closure comes out of to, for instance, change a router or aux send from a switcher to an engineer's display to easily cut cameras. This action can also be performed with the press of the joystick as well. Kind of a weird note, uh, this only lights up when it's in a different mode other than the Vericam one. So right now I'm assigned to a Panasonic PTZ on this RCP. This one is assigned to uh, a Vericam and it doesn't light up, but this one, it does light up. Just a little note. The call button works to light up the tally to the camera operator and the panel active button works to temporarily disable all functions of the RCP. The alarm light does work, but I don't know what it would alarm. The optical link light does not work because there's not a Panasonic optical link between the RCP and the camera. This SD-HC card slot uh, can read and write entire configurations or scene files of the HRP-1000 to a standard SD card, as well as performing firmware updates to the RCP. Finally, the HRP has mounting brackets that are on the bottom and top to mount the HRP into a countertop like it is here. As this guide is intended to be more focused on the native Panasonic gear that makes up CineLive and how to best operate it, I will not be reviewing the parts of our Silverback 5 system. 
and don't have the means to review the DTS system. The Silverback for Multidyne has hundreds of configurations possible, so be sure to look for yourself at their almost a la carte menu type catalog of options, or if looking to purchase, discuss with your integrator or dealer what options are best. I hope you learned something from this video. In the next episode, we'll be looking through all the menus on the HRP 1000, so that if you're ever working with one, you'll be prepared to know where items are located and what they do to the image and configuration of the unit. Thanks for watching.